Luis is, um, did his PhD in computational neuroscience at Boston University. Uh, and uh, after that, he returned to Brazil and uh, joined the faculty of the Computer Systems Engineering and Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Um, then he was at the National Institutes of Mental Health um, for a few years. And uh, then he was at the Department of uh, Psychology at Brown University um, and then Indiana University. And since 2011, he's been at the University of Maryland College Park. And there he's a full professor and he directs the Maryland Neuroimaging Center. Um, so Luis's interests uh, center around the interaction between emotion, motivation, and perception, cognition. Um, he's published a book uh, on the cognitive emotional brain. Um, and he has a new book coming out. Um, I'll plug it for him called The Entangled Brain, How Perception, Cognition, and Emotion Are Woven Together which is coming out later this year. Um, and he has uh, been uh, very active in uh, just all sorts of discussions about brains and networks and uh, philosophy and neuroscience. Uh, and uh, today he's gonna be talking to us about the dynamics of threat and reward processing in the human brain. So Luis, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, I. I think that my voice is coming a little bit low volume, so please wave around in case uh, it's, it becomes too soft. Um, okay, so historically, both the behavioral and brain sciences have been very interested in the relationship between cognition and emotion. And typically, this relationship is has been described in terms one way in which it has been described is in terms of so-called dual processing models in which cognition and emotion are relatively separate from each other. And to that, one can even add a third stream here of motivation, reward-related processing, for instance, that would be thought to be also uh, a parallel, proceed in a parallel fashion. The talk that I'm going to be presenting today reflects some of my views and some of the work that we've done in the lab that proposes a different look, a, a different framework with which to think in terms of, to think of behavior and the supporting brain processes. It's one in which we favor an integration framework, one in which, um, I don't see if you, I don't know if you see my cursor. Uh, do you see my cursor moving around? Uh, on the screen, uh, I do not see your cursor. Um, okay, so let me see if I can just. Um, there's also a um, uh, a big yeah. uh, gray box on the top right of cognition. A gray box on the yeah. Thing. I think if you oh. want share and share again, like what we did last time, it will resolve. Ah, okay, was, okay, sorry, it's not working again. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so let me stop sharing. Uh, no, share again. Maybe I'll share the screen instead of the. Um, So let me share again. Okay, it's starting to come up here. <clears throat> here is saying, oh, but then it's over with the. So just one second here, try something slightly. Some some reason WebEx is is a little slow on my so share. Uh oh. <laughs> Hopefully it'll come back here. <laughs> sure, why the Why is sharing the sharing is not allowing me to share a screen It's just changing my camera on and off. Um, okay, so any suggestions? Can you hear me at all? Yeah, we can. Uh, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, when we I can't see your video when anymore. I try share when I try share, it changes my video on and off and it doesn't show share screen options. Any clue about what I should do? <laughs> 
Uh, can you turn on your camera? It looks like it's turned off at the moment. Right, but camera. Camera says it's on. So the share screen is actually controlling the camera for some reason. Um, try this. Do you see the stop video button? Oh, you muted yourself. Luis, you're muted. So if there's uh, under the mute, hit the unmute button. Okay. Uh oh, we lost him. <laughs> so, hold on a second, everyone. We'll we'll try to get Louise back. Does anybody know any good jokes? <laughs> Raise your hand if you want to tell a joke. This is your chance. <laughs> I think it's the uh, internet speed issue. What we can do is if he wants, he can share it with me. And then I will. Okay. Oh. There he's back. Hi, Louise. Uh, you've got to unmute. Right. So, but before when you're saying that I was muted, it was not muted on my end. It was the green, uh, was green here. So there's some, there was some glitch. I apologize. Uh, let me try to share the screen. Okay. Try to share the screen. Another option is you could send your slides up. Oh, is it coming up? I, I don't think see. It, I think it should work now. Okay. Let's see. Yep. Just jump into presentation mode and we should be good to go. Um, okay, and then go to the display settings. Yeah, perfect. There you go. You, you see it now, right? Yes, looks good. Okay. Looks good. You can hear me okay? Uh, yep. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Something froze on my end and it kept not uh, allowing me to to unshare the screen. So, okay, so let's see how we can continue here. So, instead of having a framework that favors separate parallel processing, the framework that we've been working on is one in which perception, cognition, uh, emotion are conceived as something more related to uh, withdrawal and negative processing, as well as something motivationally significant here just for for concreteness, just something that is more on the appetitive end and more related to reward related processing. These these are intimately uh, related to each other and interact very strongly all the time. So instead of having uh, a more clear cut separation, we favor a stronger integration of all these sometimes conceived as separate domains. So let me jump forward here, given that we lost a little time. So let me illustrate the kinds of studies that we run in the lab. So one, lab, one, one study that we had a while ago was to look at interactions between cognition and reward. So in a version of this troop task, what we did was we had a task in which the participant had to indicate whether they were looking at a picture of a building or a house and that these strings here, these uh, these these words or or 
parts of words here, these abbreviations, these, these words were congruent or incongruent with the underlying picture, but that was task irrelevant. They only had to indicate whether the picture itself was of a building or a house. So this is a, a, just a, a slight variant in the regular Stroop, Stroop task. And in our paradigm, they performed this under a reward condition or a control condition in which they didn't receive any reward. And they had to, on each trial, they had to indicate, again, what the picture was while ignoring the, the string of the word. So what we observed behaviorally was actually that this interference, this slowing down, this troop-like slowing down that we see in these kinds of interference tasks was actually reduced with reward. So there was a cognition by motivation interaction in that this, the interference, the, the, the extent to which the incongruent condition slowed you down was decreased. But today what I want to focus on is not the behavior itself, it's a little bit on the side of the brain interactions that we thought and that we described that were supporting this, this kind of filtering effect that you were able to better filter out the task irrelevant word during the reward conditions. So the way we looked at this at first was looking at, for instance, regions that are in frontal and parietal cortex that are thought to be important for executive control and attention, including the frontal eye field and the intraparietal sulcus. And at the same time, looking at regions such as in here in the ventral striatum that, in, that are known to be important for reward. So we then estimated the responses on each individual trial. Like we had the, a sequence of trials that were separated from each other and we estimated the responses on each trial across the brain, and we correlated the responses in these regions that are important for attention and the regions in the ventral striatum, and the regions that are important for reward in the ventral striatum, and we could perform this kind of trial by trial correlation or functional connectivity analysis. And indeed, we found that during the reward condition, there was an increased, there was increased correlation between the, the regions in parietal cortex and ventral striatum in a way that was higher during the reward condition relative to the control condition. So you cannot see my, my, my cursor, right? Yes, we can. Oh, you can't see it. Okay, so I yeah. won't venture into the pen and freeze everything again. So, however, we're looking at these kinds of Typical pairwise interactions, which is often done in, in ha, have been often done in fMRI, it really only goes so far, right? We're really interested in much more large scale types of interactions that can benefit from, let's say, network analysis. And so that's the direction that we took in that study. And we looked at all the brain regions in this task that were engaged by the cues, irrespective of the cue type. Those are the regions of interest in our small network. And we took them as an index of the strength of the link between pairs of regions, the strength of the functional connectivity between the regions, the, the, the correlation on the trial by trial responses. So when we perform a community detection, a community detection, a cluster, a cluster analysis, the clustering the, the graph in, into communities, during the no reward control condition, it naturally broke down into two communities, a cortical community, including lots of regions that are important for executive functions, including the frontal eye field, the intraparietal sulcus, and another separate community that is typically thought of as more closely related to motivational processes, including regions in the striatum, such as the, the cutamen, parts of the caudate, including also the ventral striatum, and the nucleus accumbens indicated here. So there's nothing inherent, inherently correct or fundamental about this way of decomposing the network. It's just one way in which we could decompose this network during the, during the, the no reward condition. Because our interest, and this was actually based on the responses that were elicited by the queue itself. So as preceding the execution of the trial, of the stroop like trial, this troop type trial, the, this, the responses could be clustered in, in these two communities. 
our interest was in understanding how this organization might change in the presence of reward. So what we did was we took the same community organization that was observed during the control condition, no reward, and we looked at how functional connectivity, the functional connectivity pattern changed in trials in which there were reward. And these trials were, were randomly interspersed as this participant was, was, was performing the, the overall task. And so what we found was that on top of this underlying functional connectivity in which one community was more strongly, the nodes of one community were more strongly linked to each other and less so with the other community, the, the, the very definition of a community, what we found was that relative to this control condition, the functional connections between nodes belonging to the separate communities actually substantially increased and in a way that revealed this, these large scale changes in network organization in that during that situation with reward, the system becomes much less modular, it becomes more integrated during trials in which there's the, the possibility of reward as indicated by the queue. So in the spirit of this kind of analysis, we then proceeded to look at the large scale network interactions doing aversive processing. So in our case, we manipulate this in the lab by threatening by a threat of shock. So this is a, a, a mild shock level that is calibrated individually so that individuals can obviously tolerate and accept to participate ethically in these kinds of experiments in which the, the shock is calibrated so that they're highly unpleasant but not painful. So in one condition, it was a completely safe block, a period of time around a minute or so in which they simply viewed uh, a colored circle that indicated that they were completely safe. So in that condition, there were never shocks and that expectation never was violated. In during the threat blocks, they were instructed they would receive zero to four shocks that were delivered at random, at random times during the 60, on average 60 seconds. And during a subset of those blocks, they received no shocks. So the only difference between the two types of blocks in for this, these that did not receive any stimulation, they did not that there were no shocks is literally just the difference in the color of the circle. So they have the anticipation that they can receive a shock in one while they know that they're safe in the other. So the analysis that I'm going to be showing is the one in which we only use the blocks for which there were no shocks. So they're physically the same. Oh, except for the difference in, in color of the, the circles. So just very briefly here, so just to, to illustrate the kinds of uh, large scale interactions that we're interested in the lab, we then perform, um, we took nodes from traditional descriptions of the salience network, the executive network, the, the default network that come from the, the study from you and colleagues from 2011, the kind of canonical uh, common uh, attribution or the parcellation or separate of the description of the whole brain, the whole cortex. And we added to them also regions that are important for the processing of threat, including the amygdala and a region that is, is less familiar to many people, the bed nucleus of the stereo terminalis, that is also quite important that we're going to come back to in a little bit. But in any case, what I want to illustrate here is that the network organization that is observed during the safe period, considering nodes, it was around 50 or so nodes of these three networks combined, plus the bed nucleus and the amygdala, the network organization, and here indicated by which community they come from, which sub-network they come from by their color, here the, the nodes of, in red are the salience network, it, it changes considerably during the threat blocks. And we can, this qualitative illustration here can be quantified by looking at several graph theoretic measures, including efficiency and, and other kinds of um, flow of information kind of measures. And what we established, what we 
what we detected, what we found was that there is a decreased, there is a decreased efficient efficiency within these networks, essentially amounting to a formal assessment that signals were less cohesive doing across nodes of given networks during this threat relative to the safe condition. This was one illustration of how under threat, the overall large scale organization of these networks is actually altered from the standard uh, sort of resting state condition, which is essentially what people are, are having when they're in the safe block. They're just there, like just uh, not doing any tasks, just observing, just in that kind of resting state like uh, condition. So this, this illustration that I'm providing here of, of, of a change in, in, in the organization of the large scale organization of these networks is, is very crude. It's just in terms of uh, two snapshots that are based on two separate conditions during the safe condition or the threat condition. But one recent interest in the lab is really exploring more of the dynamics of how these networks are organized. And the brain, brain dynamics if we think about it, really can span multiple time scales, obviously really fast time scales that one would study with EEG, MEG, to some much slower time scales on the order of seconds that can actually be studied with fMRI. So that's one of the things that a lot of work that has looked at the temporal processing has has focused on faster techniques that can that can look at uh, electrical and, and magnetic related signals in the of the brain. But on the scale of seconds, we could also use fMRI and capitalize on, on this important behavioral scale of, on the order of seconds. So the working hypothesis kind of like supporting or, or, or inspiring this kind of work is, is that natural, natural behaviors, they, behaviors naturally evolve temporally. And so our objective in the series of studies that we're performing in from the past few years until now is really look at how these dynamic processes can inform the way in which those domains that we're interested in from for a couple of decades now, emotion, cognition, motivation, and how they interact in a dynamic fashion. So let me just describe here a study. I don't know if you have pause for questions or you leave them all for the end. Is, is there any preference? Prefer to to handle questions at the very end. Is there yes. any preference for that, or we will keep them at the end if it okay. is okay. All right, it's so fine with me. If uh, all right. right, so so as a way to try to get to closer to capturing these kinds of dynamics, we have developed a series of paradigms that are dynamic in themselves. So the very first paradigm, one of the first paradigms that we investigated is a very simple one in which there are two circles moving on the screen and they move around and the person is simply observing that there's no task in this version that I'm gonna be discussing. And if the circles actually touch and, they, and when they touch, if they collide, then the person receives a mild shock. So let me see if this, uh, this, uh, this will work here for you to see um, or Online, sometimes it just does, it just freezes. It seems to be freezing again here, but I'm not sure if you can see some of the motion of these. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, frozen. it's, it's uh, moving. Yeah. Is it moving a little? Sometimes it freezes. It's, it's, it's jumping. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. jumping, but it is changing. Yeah. So essentially you have these circles moving around, they move on the screen and if they touch, they, they retreat from each other, they approach each other, they keep moving around. And if they touch again, if they collide, then you get, uh, then you receive a shock. So we have a situation here in which we have no blocks or events, right? So it's just continuous movement of these circles. And what we want then is to characterize. So what the, the approach that we took then was to characterize activation as a function in a parametric fashion, as a function of the proximity of the two circles, the direction, whether they were approaching or retreating, the speed with which they were getting closer or farther from each other, the speed was just a very few, it was not our main aim to go really fast or really slow, but there were slight changes on in the speed, so we modeled those. And obviously the interactions between these three factors, the proximity, the direction, the speed, how, what their interactions 
So we can think of that as a simple linear model in which, and now my, my, my cursor completely disappeared. Now I came back. Uh, well, we can think of that as modeling in terms of a, a simple linear model in which you have a series of regressors, parametric regressors, such as proximity, the proximity of the two circles to each other. We have the speed, S, and we have the direction, which is just a binary approach or ret retreat. And all the two-way and the three-way interaction can be modeled simultaneously. So we have a simple, simple parametric model that we can then investigate this continuous paradigm in ways that provides this information to this dynamic fashion of, of setting threat. So what we find is that as the circles are closer to each other, regions that are important for motivational and, and cognitive processing, such as the anterior insula, parts of the, the, the frontal cortex, including the frontal eye field, the parietal cortex, intraparietal sulcus, thalamus, which is really important for threat-related processing and so on, but a series of regions get engaged more strongly when the circles are approaching and other regions sort of get more engaged, relatively speaking, when the, the circles actually get farther from each other. So, and these regions, as you can see here, pretty much overlap with a lot with the, with the, with the regions that are typically described as in the default network here in medial prefrontal cortex and posterior cingulate cortex. So we can, this paradigm also allows us to look at interactions, right? So you can have a proximity by direction interaction. So you, you had the same distance, the same proximity, but you were approaching versus retreating. So what we can do is study what we actually define in the experiment as a series of near collisions, which was, we were explicitly programmed so that we could look at the activation as the circles got really close to each other and then retreated from one another. So what we find there, if we look at the responses surrounding those events here at the time zero, is that after a period of approach here, the signal during a period of approach, the activation is actually increasing and it increases here. This is the time at zero here is the actual physical time in which there is a turning point from approaching each other to retreating and given the, hemo, given the hemodynamic lag, what we find is that this increase in activation continues for a, a couple of seconds and then two or so seconds in, in line with the hemodynamic lag, as the circles now start retreating from one another, what we see is that activation, for instance, in many brain regions, for instance, including here in the anterior insula, sharply decrease when, during the retreat. So it affords us to look into these responses and not only in terms of their sort of static, static occurrences, like in typical event related designs, but now allows us to look at more the, the, the time evolving signal and try to understand the underlying processes based on, on the signals that we observe. So let me see if this video works. And if it doesn't, I have some screens here that show snapshots, but essentially what we want to then have been doing is carrying out a series of experiments in which we expand this simple logic that we've been, in, been employing to slightly more interesting kinds of scenarios in which we can investigate hypotheses about the dynamic processing of threat and reward. So they are not really simple video game-like situations. Let me see if it, it actually shows. Let me know if you're seeing a, a video that is not completely frozen. But in this case, what we have is a person is playing here at the bottom and the person is next moving the, the university mascot right and left to either catch a coin that will give them reward or run away from the mascot from Duke University that I hear from when they used to be in the same sports league, there were, used to be um, uh, arch enemies <laughs> apparently in Maryland and, and Duke. So you have a situation in which you, you actually are looking at um, a dynamic reward situation, a pot, uh, a, the coin that is, is coming down, or one in which there is this predator coming down. So given this kind of paradigm now, we can ask several questions that pertain to the dynamics of this kind of processing. For instance, just to illustrate the kind of questions that we can investigate is a in reward studies in human, like with the monetary incentive delay task by Brian Knudsen and colleagues and many, many variants that have been studied 
over the past two decades, people focus on anticipation and delivery phases as if they were instantaneous phases and have typically reported transient responses that essentially don't have a temporal dimension to them. In contrast, in more recent rodent studies, in which the animal is more actively behaving, what they have reported is, for instance, cells in the ventral striatum responding to reward to the proximity of reward to the proximity of reward in a, in a way that is parametric to the function of reward proximity itself. So in this paradigm here, we can actually now capitalize on this this dynamic evolution during the trial and look, for instance, at responses in regions such as the ventral striatum and try to see if we find evidence for more of a ramping up of activity as the player uh, observes the coin coming down here. If you remember, this, this is a period of about 12 seconds in which the person is, is, is observing the coin and then moving to catch the coin to be able to earn the reward. And so the, the results that I'm going to be sharing that I'm sharing here with you today are preliminary results of a, a large study with 100 and so participants for which we have separated 10 or so participants to do some preliminary analysis and fix our analysis that we then are going to uh, apply to the sort of held out set. And if people wanna discuss that kind of idea in the, in, the, in the question period, I'll be happy to discuss why we're doing that. But essentially these preliminary results provide evidence that there is, especially here in the right ventral striatum, that there's some kind of proximity effect that ramps up as the person who uh, plays this during the play period and the coin approaches the person. The paradigm also allows us to look at dynamic threats. So one idea that has been extensively discussed in the, in the literature, largely speaking, at large, the human and animal literature, is that there might be separate systems that are involved in processing temporally extended and dynamic threat versus Aversive conditioning, fear conditioning, more classic, more, more standard, uh, more standard classical conditioning types of paradigms, which are known, those are known to really depend on, on, on the amygdala. In contrast, situations involve threat uncertainty, temporally, temporal extension, and dynamic forms of threat are thought to rely on another subcortical structure called the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis that is related to its, its origin uh, here, going ventrally from the ventral striatum that is, is, has been studied quite a bit in the last two decades, showing this kind of involvement in, in, in more temporally extended and dynamic forms of threat. And indeed, what we found in the threat condition was that, again, for these preliminary results, is that the, the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis appears to have this kind of ramping up activity that until the end of the play period here at time zero is, is, is literally going, we're going backwards in the analysis from the end of the play period to the beginning of the trial. Because these, these play periods have slightly different durations depending on how the person plays them. So we can align them to the end, the behavioral end of the play period. What we see is that it's a pattern of, of activity of that might have some initial transit when the person starts the trial, but gradually grows up before the end of the trial itself, which is the con final conclusion, whether you escaped or you were caught by the, by the, the virtual predator. And this kind of activity was quite different from what we're seeing, for instance, in parts of the amygdala, the central parts of the amygdala, we have specific masks that, that focus on the central amygdala. And what we see is actually, uh, to be honest, not very strong evidence of a difference between this, between the, the condition in which you have a high, high level of threat and a, a condition in which we have low level of threat. I should have mentioned here, I, I apologize, um, it's going a little bit rushed because of the, the, the problem in the beginning, but I forgot to mention critically that there are two levels. There's a coin that person earns 100 points and a coin that they earn only 10 points. So there's, in the reward case, there's a, a, a clear difference between high reward versus low reward. And the, in the aversive end, there's 
there appears to be a difference between the high threat when the person gets an uncomfortable shock versus one in which they have the bare minimum amount of electrical stimulation, which is not unpleasant, that they can just feel as a little, they, they feel that there's a sensory, there is clear uh, super threshold impression that something stimulated them, but it's a it's it's not aversive and it's very mild. So it's a high and a low level of stimulation. Okay, so let me try to see if I can actually in the last, in the, in the next uh, eight to 10 minutes kind of wrap things up so that we have time for questions. But the direction that we're taking now is that we are thinking of a, a, whole, a host of paradigms in which we are interested in, in looking at dynamics, but which poses the problem is how do we analyze these dynamics? And one direction that we've been looking at is, is looking at how some recurrent neural networks can be used to inform the dynamics that we're studying. So in this case, for instance, we have in this general, in the general situation, we have, of course, that activation fluctuates dynamically as a fa as a task, as a functional task or condition. And what we're doing then is in this version that I'm describing to you is, is feed the time series data from a series of regions of interest. In this case, there were 300 regions of interest that provided that provided a time series input into uh, um, a neural network, a recurrent neural network based on gated recurrent units. And here I'm just illustrating just a single layer just for simplicity in which this input layer here is connecting to a hidden layer that creates a latent representation, a hidden representation, uh, latent representation of the input signals in a way that is sensitive to the signals at time t, which are being fed to the recurrent neural network, but as well as past the, the previous period, as well as the distant past via the learning of temporally sensitive gates that are sensitive to time points from the distant distant past. So in this scheme here, we have a situation in which the input is being fed into this neural network all the way out to a output layer that then does some simple version of classification that indicates, for instance, that the person was watching a movie and this movie was Star Wars. And there might be as many output units <clears throat> as categories that we're classifying. In the case that we were studying, there were 15 movies. So essentially we use human connectome data in which people have movie clips that were scanned with movie clips of one to four minutes. And what we did was we used a hundred of those, we used a hundred participants for learning and selecting the architecture that we were going to be using, like one layer, two layers, and in the, most of the cases that I'm going to be illustrating it works just fine with a single layer. And we have a completely held out set of 76 individuals that we can then assess the performance of the system in a way that is completely separate from the training procedure. So in doing that, what we found was that indeed this, the recurrent neural network was able as as a function of time here. So this is actually a function of time after training. So the, the rates are fixed and the, you're feeding the time series data as the person is watching a movie. And what we find is that classification accuracy around 60 seconds or so, I think the TR was roughly a second. So it's probably, you know, it's, I think it was either close to a second or just under a second, but after, around 60 seconds of data of samples here that the network actually is capable to classify the 15 way classification uh, very well at, at, uh, at around 0.9. So this, this absolute level here is not really important whether it's 0.9, it's 0.8, or it's not really the goal to, 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 to be classifying as close to 100%, but to really understand what kind of information is being captured by this network. So we did a bunch of control uh, models to see if they, if, if we're really capturing temporary information, we can discuss that a little bit later. But 
one of the goals that I want at least to have a few minutes to talk here before we get into the question session is, is this issue of using neural networks or current neural networks of any kind of, of, of complex machinery, which is really very much like a black box. So we really doing this not because we're interested in the development of neural networks per se, although the students that are performing this are in electrical and computer engineering, so they might themselves be interested in the, in, in the networks, the, the formalism itself. But the lab, it's, the lab is really interested in understanding how they can inform about spatial temporal processes. So it's really important to try to work on opening up this black box. And one approach that we've um, that we approach, that we've used is is an approach that is 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 generally used in in classification in general with any kind of um, machine learning type of algorithm. Is essentially trying to understand. The importance or saliency of, of of specific features of the input and how they affect classification. So we performed. We can again discuss more in the in the question period. But we used a standard saliency analysis in which we we try to determine the extent to which the output activation is or is not altered is affected by changes in the input, so that we can. Detect uh, index the extent to which specific brain regions are contributing to the output decision that this is, for instance, movie Star Wars or to, to the, for the classification. So when we perform that, the saliency analysis is actually temporary in itself. So you can you can see that the, for instance, the region here, such as the left infer, in, inferior frontal cortex, shown here. Uh, in, in the very in the in the beginning of the first ten or so seconds, signals in this region are very strongly indicative of are important in, in in determining that the person is watching Star Wars, and this this saliency actually decreases and goes really low uh, around sixty seconds or so, coinciding with the time window for which. The classification now is is pretty stable. The, the system is classifying at a at a at a high performance, at a high accuracy, sixty to ninety seconds. So, I'll just go through these some of these slides very quickly, and we can unpack some of them if there is interest later. But essentially, what we're interested in is is using a series of methods, including saliency, as well as uh, lesion analysis, in which we exclude some of the brain signals. The brain regions that provide signals, so that we can try to understand the contributions of specific regions or parts of the brain to classification. Not surprisingly, lesioning the visual cortex had a very substantial effect on classification, but it is still, even without any region of the visual network, the classification is around uh, 50 something percent, which is substantially higher than. The chance level, which is one over over fifteen, around uh, seven or so eight percent. So we looked into combining lesion and saliency analysis and seeing that they provide converging information. And one of the other things that I wanted just to make sure that I have a chance to tell tell you is that what we're also trying to do is to try to use this formalism to see if we can. Based on the brain signals while viewing these clips, we can actually see whether we can, from the brain signals, we can uh, have prediction of individual differences. And the individual differences that we had access to here in this data set were measures of fluid intelligence and verbal IQ. And we have some analysis if you're interested, you can look at it in the paper that actually showed that, in fact, certain windows. During the clips are quite are fairly informative, of are correlated with the are can be good predictors of these individual differences. And just to finalize, the example that I provided here was in terms of a region of interest analysis. But of course, you can feed the the, the recurrent neural network with voxelwise data. So, for instance, voxelwise data from a given a specific region. So that you're doing basically a dynamic version of multivariate pattern analysis, and we did a version of that for voxels in the anterior insula, and we get some some classification accuracy that 
up to now it's it's fairly modest in this case we're classifying whether the circles in the moving circles paradigm were approaching or retreating it was um, better than chance but uh, still not very not very strong and so we're in the, in the process of, of refining these voxel wise analysis to understand how we can get uh, better classification accuracy capitalizing the importance of certain signals that can form classification okay so let me just uh, wrap up here so what we've been doing in the lab is using these kinds of dynamic paradigms that we claim one can use with fMRI so that it's a field that has relied quite substantially on more static end of things, as of course, with the exception of resting state connectivity, which there have been a lot of, a lot of work on dynamics uh, from, from your group as well. Um, and the challenge that using these dynamic paradigms also pose is that we really need to extend the kinds of analysis and analysis tools that we're using, some versions of machine learning techniques that are sensitive to, to the temporal domain, uh, tools from perhaps dynamical systems, more generally speaking, that could really inform how we can extract spatial temporal information in a way that relates brain signals to more interesting and complex behaviors. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, stop here, and this is work that done from a large team of, of people, lots of graduate students from neuroscience and electrical and computer engineering, uh, many postdocs and research assistants and colleagues that have all collaborated, and I'm just presenting their work here, uh, and also very grateful to the support, continued report, support from the IMH, and uh, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so let's open it up for questions. Um, so everyone, if you have a question, you can uh, either post it in the chat or the Q and A, uh, or or you can request and we'll uh, unmute you and have you uh, if you'd like to uh, share it verbally. That would be great too. Um, so I'll just step you through a few of the questions okay. um, so you can uh, don't have to worry about finding them. Um, one is from Ashkan Figari, which is what, what do you think it means that the saliency is very high at the start and then goes low? What does it tell us about brain function uh, rather than the neural network inner workings? And have you removed those early time points to see if it has an impact on the accuracy? Yeah, so can you still hear me and see me? Uh, yeah. I, I'm, the, the, my interface here is showing everything frozen, actually. I can hear you, but uh, you, everything is frozen. So uh, please alert me. <laughs> I'm not being Ah, you saw that. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, I think that's the, the question that was asked is, is exactly right. So right now we do not have... Uh, comparable version of a lesion analysis in the temporal domain in which we would be excluding those time points. But I think that that's exactly the goal is to, to extend the kind of analysis that we did to the temporal domain to try to see uh, not only in space that certain regions are contributing to the classification, but also in time. So, mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, okay, because yeah, it's very strange because it's completely frozen. So, so to answer the question, we, it, I don't think it's, I, I, right now I'm not claiming there's anything too fundamental about the brain for, with the, the ex exception of the fact that this 15-way classification is fairly easy to make. And so the first 10, 20 seconds really have signals from regions that allow the network to actually classify it fairly highly and after which changes in activation really don't change classification much anymore so therefore reflecting the fact that saliency the contribution of the activation is really much more at the beginning than the, than than you know after 30 60 seconds so i i do think that 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 is actually nothing really profound about the brain itself it's about how in this case, we're doing this classification of these simple uh, movie clips. Great. 
Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Ashkan, feel free to pipe in if you have follow up questions. Um, I will read another question from Chuanji Gao, which is Do you think the neural dynamics of threat is different from other emotional processes? For example, is happy neural dynamics different from threat dynamics, or do they have similar mechanisms? Oh, yeah. No, I actually think they they are, can be substantially different because uh, the example that I use in the lab is, and in fact, I, I, I would claim that there, that's one of the directions that we want to get to is like with individual differences. So let me give you an example. So for instance, um, I had, I don't have a problem anymore, but I used to have a huge problem going to the dentist because anesthesia didn't really catch and, and I, I just do it's really, really uncomfortable going to the dentist. So I developed sort of like a really high anxiety to the noise of the drill when it was turned on, you know, like I was immediately, actually I would become really anxious before it was turned on. And, and now I've noticed that I actually, I cope okay with it. It's not too bad. And the noise can be on and it's more when the, the, the drill actually approaches my mouth that I have higher anxiety if I kind of try to look at my own evolution of, of, of how I'm processing this. So I really think that is very specific to the type of motivational manipulation, whether it's approach related, something reward pleasant versus something that is withdrawal related, unpleasant, aversive, and, and, and to a large extent, individual differences, what, uh, like how these, these ramp up or they might stay fairly low until the very end when the person is maybe starts giving some, some uh, signal that they don't know if it's, it's more ambiguous as to is, is, it, is it pain that I'm feeling or is it just that this, this discomfort and the pressure? So it's, it would be highly context sensitive, I would say. And there's a question from Tilahan Gato. He's asking why are you using the GRU, gated recurrent unit, not others like LSTM? It was nothing too fundamental, to be honest. We started with this project uh, with LSTMs, and LSTMs, uh, we have the same analysis with LSTMs, and they work fine, they work very well. And, and then the PhD student that was working with LSTMs was recruited by um, Facebook and <laughs> left uh, for, you know, so um, better paid jobs. And we had to kind of, it was immediately very, very busy. So we kind of had to redo some of this work and, and the, the engineer who was working with it said like, oh, you know, I have an implementation of with gated recurse in GRUs. Uh, recurrent units and 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 uh, it's it's very fast and and so we started using it and, and it's actually very uh, was very easy to use so it was nothing really fundamental at that level except that I, that perhaps LSTMs there are very large classes of them but the GRUs are very effective at gating when more distant and more recent past history is informative in the learning. So it was, I, I, we felt that it was actually a very, uh, very natural way of, of, of approaching the, this, this task with, this, with, the, with the GRUs, but nothing fundamental. I have two questions for myself, if mm -hmm. it's okay to ask. Yeah. One is like the one that you were showing, there is a difference uh, when, uh, those sphere getting closer or further. Um, yeah. I was just wondering when you are talking about temporarily evolving over the time, do you also expect to see a changes in the spatial extent of these variation, like spatial dynamic, maybe more region when there's more thread or when they are getting closer, be involved or become more active? Yeah, I, I do. I do think is, this is completely. Sp I my view is this. I haven't been able to. We haven't been able to explore this much. We just you know just got funded for a period now to look at into, into this. But I really view it as, as a spatial temporal process, right? Because what happens is that if you play this, if you play this game, or if you participate in this task, it's very boring, right? So they move around and whatnot. We have a, a more active version, but they move around and. And it's not very engaging when they're just moving around. So, but you clearly get engaged when they approach each other. And again, it was going to vary 
as a function of individual differences. Some people might start engaged a little farther than others. And I believe that there's more substantial, there's considerably more substantial recruitment of brain areas with proximity, including, because all sorts of processes get, they get jump started, right? So you, mm -hmm. you're, you're trying to predict the trajectory of the circles, which is partly not predictable because and in fact, they can move away. They can, are, are you trying to predict whether they, or is this one case in which they move away? Is this one case in case in which they collide? And as they get closer, you start to actually anticipate the sensation, the aversive is actually quite aversive, to be honest, to some people, uh, they read it as, as, as pretty uncomfortable. Uh, you start anticipating the negative, uh, uh, experience that is upcoming in a few seconds, but you can't predict exactly how many seconds because the circles can, can, can move around a little bit. It was extremely choppy, but the parts that were not choppy when you looked at it, they were actually sped up. They were two times faster. So it's, the movement is a little slow. So, and it can afford changes. So it's not a super dynamic thing when it just starts moving, it, colli it, co it collides right away. So it leaves enough room for this kind of recruitment. So I, getting back to your cat question, I, I definitely think it's it's a spatial temporal recruitment that is taking place. Great. Um, one more, uh, and then we will, um, after this, just to kind of mention, we have uh, Slack channels for uh, follow-up discussions. And so we'll put all the questions there as well sure. mm -hmm. um, so that we can kind of engage further and have more interactions. Um, um, one follow-up real quick, uh, again, from uh, Chuanji Gao. Um, the lesion analysis showed visual nodes are important for the decoding of the movies. Um, mm -hmm. Is it possible that visual regions are sufficient for decoding accuracy and related to emotion do you think it's possible in some context that visual regions are sufficient for creating emotions? Yeah, so for the answer to the first part is is very easy because yes, the visual visual cortex itself, oh I see one lesion in everything. We didn't do that lesion, but I would anticipate that it would be very high lesioning everything else but vi visual cortex. But we didn't do that one. That's a good question. What is interesting to me is, was that it was not only posterior early, so to speak, visual cortex, but a lot of regions in anterior, uh, inferior temporal cortex that are object related and semantics related were highly engaged in having high importance, had high saliency and also affected accuracy quite, quite a lot when we lesion them. So it's not just the hope, you know, it needs to be investigated in quite a lot of detail, but there's a lot of, there's considerable indication that it's not just based on low level features, which would be uninteresting, right? So it seems to be um, something that is more semantic features of the movie. I don't view emotion, getting down to the second question, I don't view emotion as something that is sort of localized or localizable, the sense that you could say that it's restricted to visual cortex. Because depending on how you conceptualize emotion, it's very closely related to bodily sensation. So it really has to engage parts of the brain in addition to visual cortex, which I think is very important also, but it has to engage parts of the, the brain, including regions, cortical regions in the anterior medial cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, the anterior insula, the orbital frontal cortex that have very strong projections to brainstem and even um, other kinds of uh, medulla uh, centers that have a very strong two-way communication with the body. So both receiving and sending signals from monitoring the state of the body, right? So I'm, I'm here giving a talk, so it's actually, I'm ramped up uh, in, in, in the way my body is reacting. And so you, you kind of ha have to have that two-way communication in my view to have a more uh, full-blown type of emotional experience. Okay, great. Well, thank you uh, very much. It's uh, just a little bit after 12. So in the interest of, uh, of time, we'll go ahead and uh, close out the session uh, for now. But as I said, we'll, we'll keep those, those online discussions going. Um,
thank you so much for all your time uh, and uh, for talking to us today. Uh, really interesting talk. Thanks so much. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll log into Slack and try to follow up on some discussions that people have are uh, interested. Yeah, sounds good. And yeah, Armin will sort of uh, keep you in the loop, of yeah. course, uh, going forward. So, all right. Well, thanks everyone for joining and have a great weekend. Um, uh, and we'll see you next time. All right. All right. Take care. Bye bye. bye, -bye.